really great to see such a wonderful turnout from my first man, too. <laughs> and um, it's my pleasure today to introduce uh, painter Dustin Meese. Um, Dustin will share with us uh, seven major techniques that he learned from his mentor, master painter Art Nerdrum. Uh, I hope you enjoy it. And um, if you have any questions regarding anything, education, classes, workshops, please talk to me. I'm happy to help. And uh, Dustin, please. Good morning. Morning. This is awesome. <laughs> I'm so glad to see so many faces and familiar faces. It's really great. <clears throat> um, so I just want to say that there is like nowhere that I would rather be than like right here with you guys this morning. <laughs> this is really awesome for me. So. Um, so I want to give you just a little bit of uh, background before we start. Um, when I uh, went to college at uh, RISD, uh, it was awesome. You know, we were in this kind of uh, art school bubble, and um, everything was, you know, all about art and not about like, you know, life or business or the real world or any of that stuff, right? So that was fantastic. All we did was talk about art and do art all the time. It was great. Um, and when I left art school, uh, it was probably like one of the more challenging periods of my life um, so far, because obviously I'm pretty young. Uh, but just because I think like a lot of people um, that are graduating from college um, now, uh, you feel like you kind of went through the system and then got kind of spit out on the other side. And then it was kind of like, oh, congratulations, good luck figuring out, you know, how to make it and, you know, whatever, you know, we, you know, this is as far as we know how to take you and now it's up to you, buddy. So, uh, but it was, it was kind of a shock. And um, one of the most shocking things was after leaving art school, it was like, I was alone all of a sudden. I was kind of like totally on my own, and uh, I really felt like um, I didn't have very many people to relate to because all my friends and you know my people that really understood what I cared about and my values and everything were all around the world, and we were slowly losing touch with each other. So uh, it was it was tough. I mean, really tough. You know, and and you know the circumstances were fine. You know, I was living with my mom and all that kind of stuff. But I think every artist will understand that, you know, it's really more about the in, internal experience and, you know, the emotions can be pretty intense at times, you know, so. Um, and I remember that while I felt uh, really uh, alone and I didn't really know what I was going to do or how I was going to figure out what I was going to even do with my life, um, this was my North Star for many years. Um, this book, this like 300 and whatever, 400 page book, uh, of Odd's work was really um, something that was a guiding light for me in my life, like in my, in my life really, not just in my art, but in my life. Um, and I didn't really know why. It was one of those things where you're just so magnetically drawn to something and you, 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 you may not really quite understand it. It's not like, oh, it's nice because of this or that, but it was an intense emotion like when you meet your soulmate or whatever, you know, you're like, that's the one, you know. <laughs> so, uh, and I would just look through this book and as you can see, I mean, it's completely fallen apart, right? <laughs> so this is like evidence of my obsession, you know. <laughs> so uh, when I decided to, um, uh, what I was going to talk about today, um, I thought it would be appropriate to uh, basically just, you know, say I want to teach the major things that I learned from him um, almost as a kind of tribute as a way of thanking him because when I teach um, I always find myself talking about him I'm always saying and I've had I've studied with other painters really good painters um, but I always say oh odd did this or odd says this or odd does that or whatever you know and it's like I feel like I'm like <laughs> everyone's like yeah odd and odd already you know whatever you know but but it, he really means a lot to me um, and so um, sharing as much as I possibly can with you guys in, this, in these two hours of everything I learned is going to be a great experience for me because, um, again, it's, it's like passing it along, you know? And um, so actually, so when I went to actually live with him, I felt uh, like re-anchored 
in the world because I lived with somebody who basically uh, created his own life, his own environment and his own life. He was living completely by his own rules. He dresses in robes. I'm sure you guys have all seen pictures of him. He's got crazy white hair. He looks like a Norwegian god or something like that, like a really <laughs> crazy Norwegian god. Um, and uh, you know, he lives on, the, on a farm on the ocean, and he has dozens and dozens of students from all around the world come and live with him. And it's really uh, as, as old world and apprenticeship type of situation as exists today, as far as I know. Uh, because nobody's charged for their time there. It's free. Basically, you, you pay for your own expenses to come, you pay for your food, but he provides a place to live, a kitchen to cook your food in, and wonderful other artists to meet who all have the same um, values. So it was like another community. But the best part was seeing that this man uh, did exactly what he wanted with his life. He was living exactly by his own rules, by his own standards, painting by his own standards in very, um, at times, difficult situations. And against all odds, he created his own world. And being in his studio was not just uh, inspiring because of the way that he lived and who he was and all the knowledge that he had, but because his paintings are gigantic. Okay, They're like twice or maybe three times the size of the largest ones that I have here, okay? And when you work on a painting that's that big, you don't really, and you're in the studio, you, you don't think, oh, this is a nice picture, you know? I, I'm looking at like a nice, uh, a pretty scene or an interesting image or something that makes me, uh, you know, that's, that's just thought-provoking or whatever. You feel that you've been transported to a, a, another place, right? Another dimension. This is not... His paintings, when you stand in front of them, you feel, I'm in his world now. Yeah? I'm not in this, you know, my daily reality that I've kind of labeled and constructed and, you know, I, I get up, I do this, I do that, I go shopping, I pay the bills, I whatever, you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, this is another place. He's created an environment for himself and it literally like radiates off the canvases but the thing that's so startling is that it feels like space and the people in it feel real they feel alive and so you don't even feel like you're in a you know studio in Norway you feel like you're in his dimension that he's created okay so Every other artist that I'd seen up to that point, basically, you know, uh, it, it, there was, it, it kind of stopped at creating something beautiful. It didn't necessarily go that extra step of creating literally a window to another place. And seeing them in person was like, it was like, you know, struck by lightning, you know? <laughs> oh! You know? <laughs> like, you know? That's what you, that's, it was like, this is what's possible. Okay, so what I want to share with you today is all the technical things that I learned and also uh, the mindset as well that he approached his canvases with and that I do now that can uh, get you to that goal if that's something that you want to do. Okay, sound good? Okay, and... Um, I really want to encourage everybody to ask as many questions as possible because I want it to be a conversation and not just a lecture because it's always more interesting when it's a conversation, okay? And it makes my job a lot easier, okay? Yeah, these are all mine. And these are in different stages of completion. Uh, the, the two that are framed are finished, and uh, the one all the way on the end is a study for this one that I've been working on. Uh, I started this one two years ago, a year and a half ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and uh, then I worked on it this summer, and I'll work on it again next summer. And uh, that painting of the, um, you know, that fall scene uh, to the right there in the middle is over at the Wayside Inn. And I will hopefully also finish that this summer, or this fall. 
Um, but it's nice, I think, to see things in different stages of completion. That was one of the other things that was really cool, you know? You look at these paintings, and you see these finished masterpieces, and you have, it's like, how? How did he get from you know, God knows where to there? So that's what hopefully we're going to explore a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and then you come back to it months later. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for you stopping at the point you stop? Or it's just that you want to move on to something else? Sure. And then come back. You mean in terms of... Um, Taking a break from a painting. Right. Why oh, why do I do that? Yeah, uh, because I almost, ex almost entirely work from life. So when the weather changes or whatever, or the leaves start to change in this, this is this like late spring, early summer painting. So once the sun shifts enough or the weather shifts or whatever, I stop because I can't see, the, I can't be there anymore. And I think that that's, uh, so I'll use that as a starting point because I had my own order, right, of the things that I wanted to talk about, the seven things. Um, but one of the things is working from life, Okay. <clears throat> I know everybody talks about that. I know it's like a thing, right, that people say. And there's arguments for both ways, right? Because you do have advantages to working from a photograph, OK? But what I want to uh, talk about in terms of working from life is not necessarily the perceptual advantages of working from life, which are vast, but also the fact that you can change it. You can constantly, constantly change it when you work from life. When you're working from a photograph, you have, you, you almost, mm, you're beginning with a limitation because you're saying, I'm going to work from this image. And I think a lot of times our goal is to render it as closely to a photograph as we can. Right, But it precludes you from being able to change it on the fly at any point. You know? When I work, and when, uh, so when I first got there, right, he was doing this big painting of a girl on a horse, on horseback. Right? Huge. I mean, huge. I couldn't touch the top of the canvas if I would you know, like, and I'm, I'm pretty tall, right? And this uh, girl on the top of the horse, this big white horse, which is like practically life-size, he must have changed her outfit 10 times. <laughs> 10 times, you know? And it's not like you need to go that far, but it was like nothing was uh, fixed ever. It was like she's clothed, you know? She's nude, she has animal skins, she has like a rifle because he likes that weird stuff, you know? Whatever. Uh, he's got his own tastes, right? No judgment. And, uh, but literally changed her hair, changed her, her arm position, you know? And so this attitude of just always exploring the possibilities within every single canvas that you work on and never, ever feeling like something can't be changed is, like, is so huge. Right? I never want to feel that I'm involved in a linear process. Because as soon as I'm involved in a linear process, those creative, that creative aspect starts to shut down. Right? Because then I've just become a machine. I'm just copying something. Right? So, and, and the coolest thing, honestly, this guy's like 70 years old now. Right? He's been painting since he was 12. And he has been painting every day since he was 12. And as far as I'm concerned, one of the best painters living. And he would claim that he was constantly fumbling around. He said, he would always say that he didn't know what he was doing. I, I asked him directly one time. I said, I, said uh, I was looking at this painting that he did, this portrait, right? And it looked like a, a Rembrandt, right? The light is like glowing through the canvas. It looks like Rembrandt. I said, how do you get that glow? You know? How do you get that like ambiance, that like aura that looks like the light is not just bouncing off the person, but like almost like coming from within them? 
you know? And without any hesitation, he said, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, well, you kind of know. You know, you, you know a little bit, you know. And, uh, but he said, let's, let's figure it out together. Yeah. And I said, oh, okay, that's cool. So I spent like hours and hours just watching him, watching him. But his approach was completely nonlinear. He had tools that he would use, which we're going to talk about, right? And he had a goal in mind and no rules at all, none whatsoever. So, one of the things that I learned was that uh, mm. you have to learn how to uh, effectively um, break something down just as much as you build it up, at least with oil paints, right? Because I'm sure a lot of you use uh, like watercolor or acrylic, right? Uh, especially with oil paint, uh, it's very important to know how to take the painting apart and how to break it down so that you can build it up and then break it down, build it up and break it down. And this is the, pro this is the process that I use now. And you know, sometimes it's a little bit much. Obviously, these paintings take a while to make. But for me, the results are worth the time and the effort. So uh, when I work on a painting like this, um, I have certain techniques that I'll use that are uh, rel somewhat destructive in nature. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Karen, my neighbor and uh, part-time model in the back is laughing because uh, she modeled for a painting for me a few uh, years ago and I must have changed it like 10 times. So, uh, so she's seen this process in action, you know. So, um, but I have a good amount of impasto here, right, on my painting. Everybody can see that there's a good amount of texture, yeah. And so uh, <clears throat> as I continue to work on this canvas and modify it, the impasto is going to constantly be building up. But I want one of the most Im important things with any painting, whether it's acrylic or oil, whatever it is, the impasto, the texture of the paint, must sculpturally match the subject. Right? So if you have uh, a landscape and you paint a portrait on top of it, it's going to look weird. Right? Yeah. Everyone's going to see that it's weird. Right? It's like, oh, the, but that doesn't, it looks like there's something underneath, right? So what, you, what we need to be able to do is break it down and, uh, so that we can build it up again. So I have a palette knife here. Uh, this is a nice shape. I don't know. It, 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 the shape doesn't really matter, but it should be relatively sturdy. And uh, I apologize to uh, Marcus for making a little bit of a mess here today, but I'm going to kind of make a little mess. So um, I hold the, the, the knife at an angle that's perpendicular to the surface of the canvas, OK? And uh, somebody said this last night. I was demonstrating it to them, and they were like, oh, it's like you're shaving it. I'm like, yeah, that's a good, that's good, you know? It's like, yeah. So uh, I'm going to shave it a little bit, OK? Right? Now, I work on. Uh, a canvas that's very, very heavy, okay, obviously, because this is rough, what I'm doing, right? But, uh, and so it can take it. So obviously, probably you'd want to be a little more careful if you're working on a, on a thinner canvas, but um, I don't know. I just, I love the way this feels. <laughs> it's so nice. There's something really satisfying about it, you know? <laughs> okay. So now I would go over every aspect of this painting that I'm going to mm, make any changes to, I would say, or any intense modifications. Back up. Yeah, sure. You, when you started this, did you start with an underpainting? Because it looks like you started with a paint and then yeah. you build up. It's a great question. Okay, so yeah, I always, I know, I always start. Off. Yeah, I did, I did. I, that happens a lot. Yeah, <laughs> like, and we're in the middle of a painting. And, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Right. 
Absolutely. That happened at the last demo I gave, too. I was like, and we're here. And they were like, but what did it look like before that? <laughs> like, so, OK. No, 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 no need to apologize. So, um, so my canvas is, uh, looks a lot like this. Before I start, the edges of this canvas, like the outside, the bottom of it, right? So I'll work on a canvas that is um, kind of a gold tone, right? Like tan colored, but very, as bright as I can make it, but not white, right? So, um, <clears throat> and I'll do a sketch, a little pencil sketch, uh, uh, several usually pencil sketches, but very loose. I, I usually just do a little pencil sketch. They're kind of squiggly. They're very rough. I just want to get a sense of the design, right? General sense of the design. And then I'll do something like this. Now, this painting took, I think, about three days, OK? And um, now, uh, now uh, it's very, it, it's, it's critical for me to do uh, studies, OK? I used to never do studies because I was horribly impatient. And uh, in school, it was like, why? <laughs> you know, whatever. And, um, and even years after I, after I came back from working with him, I still didn't, didn't do it that much. I didn't do it enough. But this is very, this is, oh, it's just so important. When you work the way that I'm talking about today, okay? Not necessarily for other techniques, okay? But when you work the way that I work, it's so important because, you're, because I work from life, right? And I want to keep the painting as open as possible throughout the entire process, but I have to have a sense of where I'm going and that it's going to work, right? Because there's a big difference. Even, I mean, like, everybody in here has a camera phone or a camera or whatever. You all take photographs. And you know that you see something amazing. You see something so, so beautiful, like a sunset or whatever, right? But making a photograph that actually captures that is entirely different, right? It's like, it looked amazing in the viewfinder. <laughs> it's like, what happened, you know? And it's even more so when you work from life, right? Or when you work outside in a landscape because it's like so overwhelming. You look around and there's like, how do you even choose? How do you even distill down what you're gonna paint, right? So uh, it's, it can be overwhelming. So to do as many uh, studies and sketches as possible is good, especially before doing something like this. I mean, this is a commitment, right? So uh, anyway, and once I have this, right, then I'll start to work on the larger canvas. And th this painting looked much more like this painting in the beginning, right? So, uh, and I think that if you all look at this painting close up, you'll see that there's nothing overly complicated about this, right? It's a nice design, but there's nothing complex about it, right? It, you can, if you look real close, you can see that it's one layer of paint and very clear, flat brush strokes. Okay. Yes, yeah. So, um, and when I begin, I begin with uh, vine charcoal, okay? I work with vine charcoal and uh, uh, kids' sidewalk chalk. Okay. Vine charcoal, like medium vine charcoal. And it's because it has no um, oils in it. It's not, it's not like a compressed charcoal that's extremely dirty. It's going to gunk up all your colors and all that kind of stuff, right? This is just a burnt stick. Can I just go back a step? Yeah. Do you buy the canvas in no. the No. How do you do it? I make it. So, so the, um, I, I get raw canvas that's, um, I'll show you the back of it, but you can see Okay, so it's just raw linen, right? And the particular canvas that I get has a herringbone weave to it, and uh, you can find it on the internet. Um, it's relative, it's very expensive, but um, it's extremely strong. It's extremely stable because of the triangular pattern of the weave. Uh, it gives it incredible strength and flexibility. After I work on a painting for maybe a few uh, weeks or something, it starts to feel like I'm painting on leather tightly stretched leather, which is, it's like worth every penny. <laughs> you know, it's like one of those things you can't, you know, I, like a lot of times I'll see people working on, um, you know, like the most inexpensive, you know, canvas that they can get. And that's okay. There's no problem. But I'm always like, mm, you should get like an oil primed, 
like a linen thing, you know. I know it's a little bit more expensive, but it's just so much nicer to paint on, you know. It's like, this thing's like sandpaper. So, um, and that's important, you know. I mean, I don't know. I just, I literally, I, I, I buy probably the most expensive materials that are available because, like, you get what you pay for, and it's so much nicer to work with them. Yeah. Yes. So it's as vibrant as the new paint? Absolutely. Yep. But you don't seem to need to do that. I, I do do that. Okay. Yep. I do do that. Would yes. Would you retouch varnish or what? I, the only medium that I use is uh, here. Uh, actually, I'll just, I'm going to pass this around the room so you guys can all look at the bottle. And if you want to take down the information on here, you can. Um, but this is linseed oil with a dryer in it. And uh, <clears throat> it's perfectly acceptable to use. Uh, a lot of people don't like dryers because um, they cause a slight embrittlement of the paint at, with age. But uh, it's much more drastic if the dryer-infused oil is used to make the paint. But when it's used as a medium, it's much more acceptable. Um, but I'm also, g given that, I am transitioning to using a uh, washed linseed oil, which will accelerate the drying just the same, but uh, will not have any of the side effects. But the other reason that I'm not concerned about that is because one of the things that we're going to look at today and talk about is uh, sanding uh, the painting. Um, and, and when you sand your paintings, you create an incredibly, uh, uh, what's the right word? Like uh, well, it's like, I don't know, it's whatever the right word is for a sanded surface, but it's, it's like complete, yeah, it's, an, it, it's completely ready to create a nice bond with the next layer that you put on top, um, right? When you use your charcoal, do you put a primer over it or does it smudge? Oh, uh, oh, 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 no, no, I don't. Sometimes. Yeah, so, um, actually, so, uh, okay, so two things we're talking about are, the, uh, the drawing, right, yeah. that I use the vine charcoal for, and also the preparation of uh, the canvases, yeah. right? So uh, I'll go, I'll start from the canvases because this is, is further back. Uh, but the canvases that I create are primed with a chalk and oil-based ground, okay? It's a very, 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 very simple recipe, and it's not very difficult to make, and I'd be more than happy to show anybody, everybody, how to do that, okay? But uh, because you're working on an oil-based ground that has a good amount of chalk in it, it's extremely absorbent, okay? So uh, it also helps to um, accelerate the drying of the paint because that's the thing, right, with oil paint. I mean, a lot of people complain about that and talk about that. I mean, uh, somebody just brought a painting into a um, uh, post-road art center where I've also been teaching, and uh, they brought it in for framing, and it had been like two weeks since the artist had finished the painting, and the thing was still tacky. And I was like, oh my God, like that's crazy. My, my paintings are dry to the touch in, in a day or two days. Yeah? So it all depends on... Um, and that's because of the chalk or because of your... It's because of the chalk in the ground and because of the medium. It's a combination of both, right? But the medium is extremely simple. The only thing that I ever use is half linseed oil, half turpentine. When turpentine, of course, can be substituted for Gamsol if you want to like, go the healthy, safe route. You know? <laughs> right. But I'm outside so much that uh, when I'm, most of the time when I'm using it, I'm breathing fresh air. I'm outside, so I'm less concerned about the turpentine. Um, but anyway, that's... If that was the only thing that you ever used as a medium, that would be all that you ever need. You do not need anything else. You can use other things if you're looking for a particular effect that you get with the materials that you use. Mm -hmm. So there's nothing, there's no, there's, literally there's no right and wrong. For me, it's just how can I keep the technical process as simple as possible? Because this, this is a pain in the ass. <laughs> Okay, 
you really have to want to do this, you know, because it's, it's, it's ridiculously hard, you know. I remember uh, I was watching um, a YouTube video of uh, Vincent Desiderio speaking, and he is a really well-known artist, probably familiar to a few of you. Uh, and if you look up his YouTube videos, he's awesome. I, I just found him a few months ago. He's fantastic, okay? What's that name? <laughs> okay. Vincent Desiderio. How do you spell that? His last name is spelled D-E-S-I-D-E-R-I-O. I think that's right, but if it's wrong and you type that, you'll still get it. Um, and he's got some fantastic lectures. And uh, one of the things that he mentioned uh, one time is he just said, you know, when you paint, uh, try to get to your end result as quickly as you can, right? Don't, it, 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 it. there are so many things that you can do, so many different layering processes and so many different techniques that you can employ, but all those things being uh, taken into consideration, you should still try to get to your end result as directly and quickly and efficiently as you can because there's always more work to do. Even if you, because even if you get there in those first few layers, you're always going to say, yeah, but eh, it can be a little, it can be a little better. We can do this, we can do that, you know? So, um, so anyway. Um, she was asking about the charcoal, and um, sometimes it will mix with the paint and right. darken, so do you use, uh, put a fixative on it, or do you just... Right, right. Uh, I don't. Because uh, both the vine charcoal and the uh, sidewalk chalk, kids' white sidewalk chalk, it's just it's solid. It's very simple. Um, both of them are very easy to erase. So if I was thinking about, uh, I don't know, like adding another pot here or something, right? Now, it's not there, so I'm, I'm probably not going to do it. Right? <coughs> but I could do something like that, right? And just say like, oh, that would look nice, oh, yeah. Or I could do it with the white, right? If I'm thinking about something like that's a higher uh, value, right? Another spot of light or whatever, mm -hmm. right? But when you uh, work, when you're working, and, and you're keeping everything open, all possibilities open to you all the time, right? It's kind of good to have a tool that's really easy to experiment with. So this is great because, right? What did you mean when you said doing this is a pain? It's a pain in the ass. Yeah, what, what, what part of it? The, it takes a long time. The accuracy of the, the drawing or the... So, uh, okay. So <clears throat> the reason that I said that it's a pain is, I mean, I love it, literally, I enjoy it. I wouldn't rather be doing anything for the most part, right, so to speak. Uh, it's fantastic, I love it. But it's, it's one of the hardest things that I've ever done in my life. And I think that it's one of the hardest things to do. To make a, a, to make a good painting is very, 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 very hard, you know. So, and, and to make something it's, you know what, not even to make a good painting, to make something that you think is a good painting is very, very hard. You know, that's the thing that's hard. To make something that you look at when you're done and go, I'm proud of that. I'm, I, that, that is a good representation of what's in here. Right? That's hard. So, and I watched somebody, I lived with somebody who is 70 years old, and he's been doing it his entire life, and he's a master, and he sells his works for six figures, and it's just as hard for him. And, and, and he works his butt off every day he does this. And so, and it's, it, 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 it made me more humble in my approach because not like a false humility, you know, like, oh, you know, oh, not that, you know, you know, not, you know, whatever, that kind of attitude or whatever, but just like, okay. It's, 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 it's hard for a master. So for me to have expectations 
that I should be able to do it at this level or that level when I don't feel that I'm there yet is just putting more pressure on myself than I need, right? Then it's going to actually help me to actually make better work. So, uh, so it just it made me relax a little bit because when you know how hard it is to make a great painting, I mean, Monet would get up at sunrise. Before, he would get up at like four in the morning and go out and paint the sunrise, and he'd work on like 20 canvases a day, right? And how many paintings do we look at of his that we actually say, like, that's a masterpiece, you know? Like, that is a masterpiece, you know? Some of his cathedral facades, some of his bridges, some of his lily pad ponds, you know? We look at them and we think, that is vital. That will last. That will stand the test of time because that is really, like, something, you know? And so we don't all have to do that, you know? But I would say that, like, you know, the more that you, the more that you paint, whatever your goal, whatever your personal goals are to, to experience or to create or to, uh, you know, to see that you made, it's always going to expand. It's always going to grow. You're going to be satisfied, and then you won't be satisfied. And and, you'll, and and it's like, and I think that no matter what you do or what you want to create, right? It's ultimately, if you do it long enough, it's going to get to the point where you're trying to do that. Right? Every, every single person who, 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 who paints, if they paint long enough, will start to feel like that. They'll say, like, they'll put their work next to Monet, right? right? So I have these, like, cathedral facades. I have a sergeant right there. And so one of the things on my list to talk about today is also uh, one of the things that Odd does is he has books and books and books of uh, great artists' work, his favorite artist's work, Great is a little bit too uh, dualistic, right? Good and bad. But his favorite painters, he would have books of their work out on the floor in his studio. And every time he had a, like a new painting or something inspiring or a new Da Vinci book or whatever, he'd tear the pages out and put it up on the wall, right? And his, one of the things that, that I, I, I took away from him, which is one of the practices that I would, you know, that I, that I do, is uh, he would say, learn to compare. Learn to compare. So uh, one, of the, one of my favorite paintings that I made while I was there with him is very, very similar in style to his because that's what I was trying to do. When I went, I emptied myself completely of everything that I knew, and I just tried to paint like him. Because if I could do that, then I, would, then I knew that I would take away as much as possible uh, and I would make it my own later, but if I could just paint like him at least once or twice, that would be a huge accomplishment, right? And so while I was working on uh, one of the best paintings that, I, that I've made so far, in my, that in my heart that I feel is one of the strongest things I've made, uh, I was completely stuck. I didn't know what to do next, and I was feeling completely discouraged. And this painting went through so many phases. It went through so many bottoms, like, oh, I'm going to throw it away. Um, you know, I'm furious. This is terrible. Whatever. You know, like, really, seriously. And, uh, and so one night, everybody was asleep. It was probably like 1 o'clock in the morning, and everybody's in bed. And I went over to his studio, and I took my painting. I put it up next to his. <sighs> <laughs> you know, it's like depressing, you know, and it's tough, you know, but, um, but I looked, I just sat and I just, I just looked, I just looked at his painting, I looked at my painting, I looked at his painting, I looked at my painting, and then it was like, oh, what if I added a little bit more crimson in the sky? It needs kind of a glaze of this reddish color because it's too, uh, it's too, it's too uh, blue or something like that. It's too blue-green. It needs a little bit of this pink color in it. That'll kind of well, round it out a little bit. But the thing is, I could see so much more clearly the weaknesses in my work when it was right next to his. Yeah. And like, I think that we shy away from doing that a little bit because it's a scary comparison to make. But it's like, why not? You yeah. know? It's like, I want to paint like that, you know? So if you don't know what to do, take out your favorite painter's work, 
you know, and put it right, put it, put the book right next to the, on the easel, next to yours, and start flipping through it, and find one that is representative of what you're trying to do, you know, because everybody's, I think a lot of people are so concerned with, like, being original, right, We're like, oh, I want to make, like, my thing, you know, that's, like, totally different and new, and I don't want it to look like somebody else's work, or copy their style, or whatever, but uh, you'd be amazed how much you learn just trying to paint like a, a, another artist. If you really try to make it look like another artist, it's like it's, you'll learn more than you've ever learned, and it's incredible. You'll, you'll have, like, the more that I paint, the more that I have an appreciation for every other artist that I see. Like all the stuff on, this, on the walls, you know, when you look through anything that's, that's, that somebody's pulled off and made look really great, it's like, that's, that's, that's awesome. Because it's just so damn, it's just, it's hard, you know? So. Do you pay attention to transparent type of paints as opposed to opaque? Is that <clears throat> part of your thought process? I actually, I actually don't. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that I, uh, one of the other things that I learned from him is working with a, is a very, li a very limited palette, okay? And I know, again, a lot of the things that I'm going to say today are not new but I hope that I'm going to say them in some way that is slightly new or you'll hear it in a different way that will be like, oh, I could kind of implement that like this or, you know, whatever. Maybe just a different perspective on the same thing. So if you look at uh, his, his stuff, and I brought some of his books in case you haven't seen them before, right? He works with black, red, yellow, and white, and nothing else, okay, nothing else, and he makes beautiful blues, and beautiful greens, and beautiful purples with this extreme limitation, because black, again, if any of you ever paint with me, you know, You'll know that, like, the first time anyone ever paints with me, they're like, oh, what, what colors do you use? And I'm like, oh, well, I use white and black and, <gasps> you know, it's like, like the dreaded black, you know. Um, but black is blue, okay? Black is blue. Lamp black is probably the warmest black and acts a little bit more like brown. But ivory black and many, many other blacks, they, they're blue, okay? If you treat it like blue you'll experience it completely differently. Because the, uh, the impressionists did not use black. They just stayed away from it. Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, and everybody has to, you know, pick their, their, their palette, pick their preferences. And that's a hard process, right? I just spent the last several months figuring out completely new colors to use for myself. Uh, and it took a long time. Um, and I'll tell you, I mean, you can, I'll tell you what they are if you want to use them. It's, it's no problem. Um, but this is based on his palette. His black, red, yellow, and white is what I used as a philosophical foundation for using these colors. So <clears throat> what I wanted to do when I first chose my palette was I wanted to have black and white, right, red, yellow, and blue, right? Because for me, I wanted to get a little bit more of uh, the, co the strong colors that you would see in, like, Impressionist work, okay? Because for me, that's where I want to go, you know? I want to move in that direction, you know? I want to implement some of the things that I see in Monet's work, which is not... I can see that one of the coolest things about working with somebody like Odd is that you see his techniques in Monet. I, I see them now. I see, oh, that's how he did that. You know? But one of the saddest things about uh, contemporary art, in my opinion, is that it represents the breaking of a lineage, like a gap, right? Because you used to have artists working as apprentices in studios, right, and learning all of these like, traditional techniques, right? And then there's like this gap where it's like it kind of, I mean, there, it exists, right? And he, to me, represents a, like a link, you know, to the past, right? But you see that, like, <clears throat> there's, all, there, there's, there's very few simple principles to work with, when you, right? 
And it, and it is simple. It's just really not easy. So, uh, but the idea is that uh, I wanted to, what I wanted is to have black, white, red, blue, and yellow. I was going for, if I could, if I could find the right three, that would just make me so happy. I want to do as few as possible, right? And I did this, this painting so far only has black, white, uh, red, yellow, and blue, those exact uh, red, yellow, and blue that you see over there, right? Okay. Can I ask a question? <clears throat> yeah. There are different types of red. And Absolutely. Are you going to mention that? Yes, definitely. So that's the thing that makes it so hard. We are absolutely overwhelmed by choice. It's insane. And if you go and you look at like a rack of Williamsburg colors or Old Holland or whatever, you have hundreds and hundreds of colors. It is outrageous. And if you actually look at the pigment list, like, because this is just one raw pigment, right? This is quinacridone red. Right, and uh, you mix it with linseed oil, and you have paint. Right, yeah. but yeah, so uh, but mo but men like <clears throat> more than half of the colors, like seventy percent of the colors that you see on the rack are mixtures. Right, they're pre mixtures, so you're no longer working with the simple components. Right, you may have one tube of paint, but three or four or five different pigments in it, which is one of the most uh, it adds so much complexity, it makes things more difficult. So, um, and I'll just explain really quickly. Uh, when you, so when you, <laughs> hello. <laughs> uh, when you're uh, working on painting, right, one of the things that you want to use is, you literally want to use as few colors as possible. You want to use as few pigments, as few tubes of paint as possible because it makes it so much easier to create harmony in your painting. Right? I, would, I would say, I would, I would propose right, that one of the like, eternal uh, principles of beautiful art is harmony, in my opinion, right? visual harmony. And color harmony is probably one of the most difficult things to achieve, right? You can, you, because you can work on a, a painting and put a, you, you can just see it when, when pigments don't, when they, when they don't work together, when they don't talk together, when they don't speak the same language. It's just there's something about it that's out of place, right? Because every pigment has limitations. It all has this particular character, right? So it's like people that don't get along, right? So, uh, so the idea is <clears throat> the way that I selected these colors up here is I uh, spent many, many, many hours making different pigments and ordering samples of different pigments to find uh, the, few, the fewest possible that I needed to make what I could, what, I, what looked to me like a rainbow. I wanted to make, I, I just wanted to work with perfectly balanced, uh, well, uh, well organized, that work together uh, pigments that look as close to the colors of a prism as possible, right? Because when you're painting, you're not painting things, right? When you're working from life or whatever you're working from, one of the things that we get so hung up on is like, I'm painting a tree, I'm painting an apple, I'm painting a river, I'm painting a glass of wine or whatever, right? No, you're not. <laughs> you're painting light. Only ever, are you only ever <coughs> painting light, right? So if I can have a, a palette, a very, very simple palette that allows me to create a rainbow, a beautiful, simple rainbow, then I have everything I need, right? Everything I need. So, <clears throat> and one of the... Uh, if, if you want to make paintings that, that kind of, um, I would say, simulate the visual sensation of space, right? Because to my eye, like when I, when I look at my work, that's one of the ways that I know that I'm happy with it, right? Is that I look at it and I, I, yes, I say, oh, it's detailed or it's this or it's that or whatever. But if I look at it and I don't necessarily see a painting, but I see like an opening, right? I see uh, space, right? So 
to create that effect, you, you absolutely have to work with as few colors as possible uh, because a, 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 li a little bit of every color has to be in every other color. Right? A little bit, not a lot, but like a little, like a little bit. And um, one of the best demonstrations that I ever saw of somebody uh, teaching this was uh, a plein air painter. And uh, there's this quick video of him on YouTube, and he articulates it this way. He says that the definition of harmony is a common denominator. And so the way that he would achieve that is he, he only, he found his red, yellow, and blue, and white or whatever, and black. And before he started, he would have a big pile of red, a big pile of blue, and a big pile of yellow. And he would take a little bit of all of them and mix them together in the center to make like a gray, right? And then he took a little bit of that gray and mixed it back into his big piles of color, right? So right away, before he even started to work, he already had a natural harmony of color, right? Be he harmonized them by taking a little bit of everything and putting it in everything else. Right. Red, yellow, and orange, and uh, blue is, yeah. is I don't, what he made his gray from originally. Exactly, yeah, and then mixed it back into the others. So that's one way that you can, that you can do that. Um, <clears throat> I don't remember his name. Yeah, it's either like California or Colorado or something, and he uses like big quantities of paint. He works with, he paints with both, he's the only person I've ever seen who works with both hands. So if you ever see a video of him working, I'll, I'll try, uh, God, I, I can't remember his name, I'm no, sorry, but, <laughs> what did you say? What is it? John Cosby. John Cosby. He does paint that one, I don't know if that's the one, but he does do the pot. Yeah, perhaps though, it could be, yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> do you do that? I, what I do do is that I make I don't necessarily do that in terms of process, but what I do is, uh, this is my horribly dirty palette. It's ridiculous. But, yeah. Oh, and this is foam core, by the way. I, if somebody told me this morning that the most oohs and ahs I was going to get was showing us that my paint. I would not have believed you. Anyway. It's like, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right, that's true, right, right. Yeah, it's all the stuff you can do. Yeah, it's light, it's light, and it's, um, I mean, and you, you, you know, once you, um, once it breaks down, you make a new one. Yeah, you just make a new one. Um, so I like, I have these, and they're cool, and when you're done with them, you can put them up on the wall. They're like decoration. <laughs> Studio decoration, right? So... Um, so what I do is at the end of every session, right, I take my palette knife and I scrape up all the paint, not all, like I leave the, the dollops of paint, right, but I'll scrape up all the stuff that's been mixed and I mix it all together and I get this. This is, I don't know if you can actually even see it because it kind of blends in, but there's this like dollop of gray or whatever, right? That's just from yesterday, right? So now, I ha like, if you buy a tube of gray paint, you're wasting your money. Because, <laughs> because, that looks like titanium buff. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I don't know what that is. Well, it's a, uh, that color. Yeah. Oh, oh it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a name. Yeah. Oh, Robertson's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. So, uh, but, but, but see, the idea is that, like, there is no, uh, this is the best gray that's ever been made for this palette, ever. You could, you could, you just, you can't get a better gray for this. It has the life of the other colors. And it's, be it's, it's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. It's so awesome to work with. Because, like, even when you put it down as a flat, even when you, you're not using it to dull other colors and you're just putting it down as, like, uh, some of the gray that's, like, in the painting or whatever, uh, it, it's so beautiful because you can see that it's not just one dead pigment, one gray inert pigment. It, it has 
quinacridone red in it. It has this beautiful lemon yellow in it. It has an orangey yellow in it. It has green in it. it has everything is in it. And, you, and it's not like, I, I'm not even sure if you'd be able to, like, if you put two swatches down next to each other, like, of just straight gray and a mixed gray, you'd be like, you'd quickly be able to identify. But you just, when you see it in person on the painting, you feel it. You feel it visually. It's like, that is saturated with color, but it's gray, right? Don't you have the urge to make a porn of it or something? Because I run out of this stuff all the time, and then when I try to recreate it, I can't get it. Yeah. Well, I just, you know, I, I find that I always have enough of it. I, I kind of, I usually have more than enough. That's what this is, you know. This is just like what is falling apart, you know, right? So. Um, but yeah. You need to mix more of something. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right. If you, yeah, if you've got like twenty paints, it's like, oh, which one did I use? I remember that before. No, I. Re it's weird to even think about it now because, like, I'm like, I, some people people ask me, and I'm like, what do you mean? How did how did you make the color that you made before? Because with this palette, there's only one way to make everything. So it's like, you know. Whatever, um, but the but the idea is that uh, so but <clears throat> so the so one of the things that I, I don't want to forget to to say is that when you're when you are selecting your colors to work with right if if you're buying tubes that have like the swatches right on the on the on the label or whatever that's the easiest because it's literally you're looking at the paint right but uh, if you're uh, if you if you don't if you're buying um, whatever, ones that don't have them on the outside, so, you know, you want to squeeze a little bit off so you can see them, right? Put them all next to each other, right? They should be, you should, if you start with beauty, it's going to be a whole lot easier to make beauty in the end, right? But if you, like, but it, I, I tried, like, seven different greens, all in the same range of green. Viridian, there was, uh, I, I don't, but they're all, like, I don't know, whatever. They all have that emerald green color, right? Um, phalo, oh, phalo, phalo green, right? Phalo green is outrageous. It is like, mo they told me when I bought it from the, from the store, the sample or whatever, the guy was like, now make sure you clean your stone that you're grinding your pigments on like really well after you make this green. Because even like a tiny bit of it will just destroy everything else. It's so intense. So this is cobalt green. And this is a very, uh, it's actually a, tra it's, it's kind of an older pigment that never really um, got popular because right around the time that they started making it, they also started to make Viridian. And Viridian's much stronger, and for some reason it became really popular. I've never used Viridian. I can't stand it. But, uh, but that stuff is excellent because it's not, it doesn't overpower other things, and it has a much more harmonious character, especially if you're using cobalt blue, right? So this is cobalt blue. And, uh, and they work they, they, I mean, makes sense, right? Cobalt blue, cobalt green. They work perfectly together. They're lovely. Um, but that looks, but don't these look nice? Just all lined up like that? You know? <laughs> yeah, they, <clears throat> so uh, this is, um, these two, uh, you, might, you probably won't be able to purchase as a paint because they don't really make it, but there are, as, this is, almost the equivalent of a cadmium yellow deep, and this is nearly the equivalent of a Hansa yellow or a permanent yellow light, which is the name that uh, Williamsburg gives to their Hansa yellow. Um, now, <clears throat> one of the things that I'm going to show you today is just a really quick demonstration of uh, sanding painting. Okay, I'm not going to sand the whole thing. I'm not going to do it very aggressively, because right? I don't want to put it all in the air. Right? Oh yeah, you want you guys want to know the other colors, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sir. So, uh, so uh, this is uh, you guys. Uh, Michael Harding, by the way. I, I just after I started making my own paint, I did so much research on like pigments and oils and these things. And I have to say, like there are a lot of good paint manufacturers. Michael Harding is far and away the best. There's no question. The materials that he uses are 
the best that can be purchased. Williamsburg, I, I still use Williamsburg on occasion and other things, but if you're like, looking, if you, if you're like I want the best, whatever, you know, Michael Harding. So uh, this is um, essentially Michael Harding. Uh, what's the name of the red? Naphthol. Naphthol red. Uh, his naphthol red. Not, ev- see, ev- not every naphthol red, though. It can't be like... It's diff- it would be different than um, Old Holland Naphthal Red because the names of the colors that you buy are just uh, like a superficial name, right? But they're, and even the pigments that they use, you could literally buy the same pigment from manufacturer to manufacturer and it would still be different because they get them from different pigment manufacturers, okay? And there's even variations within the same uh, pigment. So this is basically Michael Harding Naphthal Red. And uh, cobalt green, cobalt blue, um, Hansi yellow, and quinacridone red is what I use. But, but uh, the yellows, yeah. you said, sort of sound like they would be close to the big cad yellow and the Hansi yellow. But what did they call them? Oh, um, Hansi yellow, it would be the same. Uh, but these ones that I have uh, are, <laughs> you can get them from Kremer pigments if you do make your own paint or you ever want to. And this is um, uh, bismuth yellow lemon. And um, bismuth is basically, essentially it's a, it's a type of pigment that's, that has the same light fastness and intensity as cadmium, but it's just not as popular, right? It, for some reason, like there, but there are a lot of people that think that it will become more popular than cadmium because it's just as light fast, it's just as strong, uh, and it's non-toxic. Yeah. yeah, it's much cheaper. Yeah. Do you have to mix those for oil, or can they be used for like watercolor? They can be used for watercolor too. Yep, mm-hmm. or acrylic if you make your own acrylic. Uh, and this is a mixture of different bismuth pigments. Uh, they're mostly in the yellow family, uh, and this one is, has a, a formal name because it's a mixture of different types of bismuth, and it's called um, Bristol yellow. Okay. Kremer is in um, New York. Yeah, and uh, that tube of uh, the, the the jar that I passed around has uh, that's from Kremer. Okay, they make really really uh, fantastic um, artist materials. Really good. Um, so yeah, but they're, I mean, I don't know. Like I have those up on a shelf in my studio because they just look, they're like nice together, right? It's like, oh. <laughs> okay. So, everybody okay so far? Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, one thing on the brushes, you didn't mention the brushes. You used one brush or you used all of those brushes? I use a handful of brushes. I use a lot of different brushes. Um, I like synthetic um, brushes. That's just my taste um, because I like their, and I just destroy them. But uh, I try to keep them nice for a while, you know. <laughs> it just doesn't happen, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I use a whole host of different things. Um, but mostly I really like um, Princeton, um, Princeton Synthetic White. Uh, they're really great. Uh, they hold up. Uh, they have a nice softness to them. They're, they're strong, but flexible. They're great. And they're inexpensive, too. Okay. Yeah. I would suggest that everybody save their questions, because we are really getting yeah, yeah. late on time. So we'll let, let this gentleman give his <laughs> What time is it? It's another 30 uh, It's 2812 now, so I think we only have... Oh, oh my god. <laughs> Time flies. All right. Okay. Okay. So. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I'll list them all for you at the end. Okay. So um, what I'm going to do quickly is I'm just going to show you uh, how what it looks like when you sand it. Okay, and then what, what I would do next in the process. Okay, so, um, so the first thing that I would do 
if I'm, not even if I'm making drastic changes, but if I want to take any aspect of my painting to the next level. Uh, typically, I'm going to, and, and, and none of these are hard and fast rules. That's the thing that to keep in mind. I went looking for formulas, and I found none, okay? I only found attitudes and principles, okay, and, and, uh, and tools, okay? So <clears throat> I will, uh, you know, give it a good scraping. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's okay. It, what it does is it begins to, uh, it, it, it reduces the impasto of the paint because the impasto is the texture, right? And the texture is constantly building up. But we need to be very, very careful about the impasto because there's so many different, there's, there's, no, there's no, every time you make a little mark, right, there's an infinite uh, complexity of that mark. There's the direction that you moved the, the brush in, there's the value of the color, there's the hue, there's the saturation, mm -hmm. right? There's the thickness of it, there's the sculptural qualities that it may have. It, it, it just is it, unbelievably infinite, right? And so when, I, when I'm making a painting, or with the, the, I would say the paintings that I appreciate most, is that you look at them and they're beautiful just to look at and observe from back here, 10 feet away, whatever. But then when you get really close, they're beautiful too. Because it's not just the image that's beautiful, the paint is beautiful. The paint itself is beautiful. And that is so cool. That to me is just like, so when I work, it's like that's one of the reasons why I would continue to work on something that looks like it's almost done. Because it's like, yeah, it's almost done and it's really nice, but I can't get up here and think it's fantastic and from back here and think it's fantastic too. I, I, wanna, I wanna be able to explore this thing like endlessly, right? So I'll sand it, right? And you can use, um, this is 80. Uh, or you can use, I, I usually use 80 or 120. Also, never, please, never, ever sand your paintings if you use cadmium paint or if you use, uh, the, or if you use the color Viridian, right? Never, ever do it because they're so toxic. They're so bad for you. So it's okay if you're just using them normally because we all use, cad, I'm sure many of you use cadmium. Probably almost everybody in this room has cadmium paints in their box. It's okay to use them, it's fine, but never ever sand them because when you atomize them, that's when it becomes very, very dangerous, okay? But all the paint that's in here is inert, okay? All of this is non-toxic and that's why it took, that's one of the reasons it took me so long to find the prismatic colors that I wanted because it was hard to find really intense colors that weren't toxic, you know, because a lot of those more intense colors are whatever. So, um, It's it's actually it's literally just the dust from the from the paint that's on here that's that's kind of starting to make it look a little hazy, right? So. That's right. That's why I'm like, two weeks to dry? No, thank you. That would not, I couldn't do that, you know. So, so with a canvas this size, uh, I probably would be working on like sections of it at a time in terms of sanding. Also because like sometimes I'd go out and work on it for a while and it'd be wet or whatever. And then, um, you know, like this part may be wet from working on it yesterday, but this may be completely dry. Right, so I try to sand when it's, when it's dry and uh, use, again, you know, a lot of the materials support the accelerated drying. 
Yes, but then, but like, but then it will all get built up, right? Because you're not really looking at very much. Not a, some of it. Some of that was sanded and then not painted over again, right? So some of parts of that were flattened down, like I'm doing right now. And then when they were uh, glazed or wetted again, they uh, they they come back, right? Because this really tar- it, it 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 dulls the effect of the paint dramatically, right? So the first thing, the next part that I would do, right, is kind of just like wipe off some of the excess, right? And then uh, just like somebody else suggested, you know, I'm going to um, take a little bit of oil, right? And I'm going to do, uh, every, I mean, I don't know if you guys know or whatever, the technical word for this is um, oiling out. Okay, so you take some of your medium, right? And you could do this on unsanded surface as well, right? And actually, to tell you the truth, if I was actually doing this, I would have sanded it longer. I would have gotten it a little more uh, flat because I still read a lot more texture here than I want, right? It's literally just um, linseed oil and turpentine. And, uh, and once you, when you rub it on, you want to uh, rub it off as well. So you don't want to get like a huge, um, you know, like a quantity of medium like soaking on your canvas or whatever, right? So you would rub it on and then you rub it off as well, like wax on, wax off, right? Yeah. Uh. Has this in it? The medium. Yeah. Uh, it says varnish. Do you use that as your varnish also? Uh, no, I use. I just use Gamvar. I, I like because it's so easy to put on and remove, and it's um, archival and all that good stuff. <laughs> well, I'm okay. Yeah, sure. I can go through them. <laughs> and there's more things in the than these than you know these or whatever, right? So it's not like a, it's a, it's, you know, it's a small list, but I, the things that I found to be the most valuable, right? Okay. So uh, learn to compare, okay? Be bold and put your work right next to your favorite artists and try to paint like them, you know? There's no, you, there, you, you're not going to lose yourself in trying to paint like an artist that you admire. You'll take it as far as you can, and you will extract everything from that that you know you want to use and incorporate. It will make you more yourself. You know, I mean, even Odd went through phases of trying to paint exactly like Caravaggio. Okay, and he did. He painted just like Caravaggio, and then he moved on. And then he painted just like Rembrandt. And then he painted just like Titian, and he just kept trying to do it like these people that he admired. And he was he was intense enough and brave enough to put his work right next to theirs because it's, it's, it's intimidating, but it will make you better. So uh, the second thing is literally fumbling, okay? Don't try to, if you approach your uh, painting with a, a linear idea of the process that you're going to go through, to just just to copy a photograph or whatever, you know, you're going to, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. For me, it's like, it's like it takes something away. It limits the experience that I'm going to have in creating it, and it limits the possibilities of the end result. It should like, it should always, 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 always be. You should just be completely open to change. Everything and exp- and that's the, th- the thing about fumbling, right? Is experimenting. The, see, it's it, you know, I'm going. I'm giving you a bullet point list, right? And these and these things. When I as soon as I say them out loud, on every single one of these things, you're just going to go like, oh, okay. But if you do them all, if you really use, if you really do these things, your work will it will it will be powerful. Maybe you'll you'll go up. So, uh, but the thing about this is, right, 
I don't know what I'm going to do next to this. I, I have no idea. It's not, and, and, and honestly, I think that that's, the, that's if, there's a, if there's strength in, in my work or when I see strength in other people's work, I think it's because they started with a goal in mind, but they, but they stayed open, and, they, and as they're going through the process, they tried to stay in that state of not knowing. I don't know. I literally have no idea. But if I see something that looks better than what I have, or cool, or fantastic, or whatever, or a stroke of light, or a patch of this, I want my, the, the, the idea is to design the physical process of painting so that you can always <coughs> capitalize on those chance opportunities or those random things that happen. Literally, Andrew Wyatt said that almost every single one of his best paintings had what he called happy accidents in them. And one of his, one of his principles when he worked was, because he would go and paint his neighbors and stuff, right? He would, they, all his neighbors would model for him. He would make sure that they understood never to leave something in its place or not change, like if there was a tree down on their property and they were going to have it cut up before winter or whatever, he wouldn't, he, if he was painting it, he'd be like, don't, don't, don't leave it there for me. Don't, don't leave it there for me. Do what you do totally without, with total disregard for my process as an artist, right? Because if you try to keep something in place, then, you, he, it, then the painting might have been better if they moved it, right? If they did what they normally would do. It's like, and in that way, the painting becomes this kind of uh, unfolding creative process instead of like a fixed linear process, okay? Uh, the next thing is, um, you know, learning how to destroy to create using sandpaper, right? And uh, a palette knife. So that you can, can, so that the painting becomes as much a sculpture as it does a painting. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you use the sandpaper on acrylic? Uh, as far as I know, yeah. I've never done it before because I, I don't paint with acrylic, but I'm pretty sure you can. And again, this is one of those practices that I would just caution, just be safe about it, okay? Because if you don't know what's in your paint, it, it could be toxic, and just be, just know what you're using. And if you have any doubts about it, you know, getting like a respirator or whatever at Home Depot is like thirty bucks. They're really cheap. Okay, so, uh, and one of, and then the next thing is going to be uh, <clears throat> utilizing paint uh, layer upon layer and understanding uh, both scumbling and glazing techniques. Okay, Titian uh, said that. His paintings were uh, glaze on top of glaze on top of scumble on top of glaze on top of scumble. And all, that, all, that, all those words really mean are uh, you're using a transparent or slightly translucent paint, right, that's thinned with your medium that is on top of something else, right? So you're not necessarily using the paint in an opaque fashion all the time, but you're, you're constantly capitalizing on the fact that all paint is slightly translucent, right, and can be built up, right? And it's this like layering upon layering of both opaque and transparent uh, layers that create an, just an exquisite sense of three-dimensionality, right? And it also harmonizes your colors, right? So when I, when I the next step for me in this uh, painting is to, um, like say I wanna make this thing start to look like it's glowing or whatever. Oh. Right, the, the list, the list, get back to the list. <laughs> but how am I going to keep you here? Oh, you don't know the end of the list. You know, <laughs> you know? okay, so, okay, so um, to create a sense of uh, uh, form, and a sense of reality or three-dimensionality in your work, uh, you have to obey the fact that values rule all, right? And being able to see value clearly is one of the most powerful things that you can possibly learn to do ever. And this tool, which I will pass around, and I want you all to just... Take a look through it, and uh, the bigger opening side of it 
goes like against your eye, and then you close your other eye, and uh, you look through it. And this is, um, you can all write this down, okay? This is um, the company that makes that, that uh, filter is uh, Tiffin, okay? T-I-F-F-E-N. And um, <clears throat> it's called a black and white viewing filter. And the actual name of it is a black and white viewing filter number one. <laughs> number one. <laughs> okay. It's like $47 on uh, Amazon or bnhphoto.com. And it is literally like one of the best investments you'll ever make. Ever, ever, ever. Because it's not just the... Uh, it's not just form and space that are created through values, but your composition is ruled by values. So when you're trying to figure out what to do next or what to modify or what to adjust or whatever, you're going to do a whole host of different things, right? Look at it in a mirror, turn it upside down, look at it in a mirror. <laughs> that should have been one of the things on my list, okay? It's not even on my list, but it should be. I get, it kind of goes with this, right? learning to see your painting differently, you know, finding all these different ways of looking at it differently in different situations. So that would, that's number uh, five, you know, five, five, right, that we're on. So, you know, yeah, yeah, turn it up. yeah. So one of the things that he would do is, like, he has, uh, <clears throat> he has uh, fluorescent lights in his studio, okay? He works under like this cold, fluorescent, just awful light, god-awful light, right? But when you put his paintings into studio light, like warm incandescent or tungsten bulbs or whatever, and you see them, it's like they come to life. You know? so, but he would paint under these very difficult, jarring lighting conditions. And then if, he could make, if you could make it look good in a fluorescent lighting situation, then it would look good anywhere, right? But literally, this tool, if, and if you look at the paintings through that tool, yeah. you can see that, like, and a lot of people, this is their reaction. They look at it through the, the black and white viewing filter, and they're like, I like it better through that. I like it better with less color in it because it, it almost gives everything, like, a sepia tone. Yeah? yeah? So, uh, and you'd be amazed. Like, you, like, amazed at how, how little strong color has to do with creating beauty in painting. Right? It's so much, it's, it, at least if you're working in a, a realistic style, let's say, or with a, you know, an emphasis on realism, it's, it's just, it's like, it's values. It's all values. And that's why his palette, right, of black, red, yellow, and white works so well. Because color never gets in the way of this just clear and exquisite sense of values. And that's, and, and part, and a lot of the things that were, even sanding, even scraping and sanding and glazing and scumbling, all of these things contribute to uh, making it easier to paint values in a very, mm, like, in a very refined way. Right, because it, it can create very nice gradual transitions. So, uh, and um, six is working from life. It, like, I, yeah, it might have been. I know I'm out, of, I'm out, I'm out of order here, you know. So, but um, working from life because he said that he did. Um, and this is just him, right? I mean, I adopted these things because there's a, certain, there's a certain part of me that just feels the same way that he does about art, right? So it's like, and I have this similar values. So, so all these things that I'm saying, remember that, that not, they're, not, they're not rules. And that's the thing. So even when I say paint from life, it's like, understand that like, the way that you go about your stuff is completely individual. And that totally needs to be respected. But if you want to paint, uh, if you like what I do, if you want to paint, like in some, if there's some aspects of what I do that you like that you want to embody, or like him, right, or Monet, or whatever, it's like you have to physically paint like them, 
which means you have to physically do the same things that they do, right? There's so many people that like want to paint like impressionists, right? They're like, oh, like they love Monet or whatever, but they don't do what he did. You know, it's like they're painting in their studios with their, you know, with whatever colors they're using, you know, uh, of hundreds of colors, and uh, and trying to do what he did as if it was a conscious process that he did. What the way that Monet paints, right, is not like oh, like this color would look good next to this color, so and this color looks good with this color, right? And it'd be cool if I made this tree pink or whatever. You know, it's like if you could look through his eyes, you're, you'd see his paintings, right? Because that's he saw the colors that he painted. Right? He saw the colors that he painted because he spent so many hours observing nature. And one of the coolest things that happens when you, when you spend that much time with nature is that you see that there is pink in green. Right? That there is, like, yellow in red. And there's all these harmonics of light that you don't normally see, but if you spend enough time painting from nature you start to see them, and they become more dominant than what you would see at first glance because you begin to train your eye that way so much. So uh, if you want to paint like Monet, which I'm sure some people do, or there's some things that they really like about it. I mean, the guy was one of the most popular, famous artists in the world. It's like you have to do what he did physically. And the last one is working with a limited palette as few colors as possible, as few colors as possible, and making sure that before you begin that you're working with paint that harmonizes naturally, pigments that harmonize naturally. If you do, everything will be easier. Everything will be easier. So I'm just going to give you a really quick uh, example of <clears throat> what it would look like to... Um, put a little bit of, I would say, scumbling on this uh, canvas, right? So this, uh, the statue on the right side of this painting is being hit with like this bright burst of uh, sunlight, okay? Like it's really nice. The afternoon sun comes down and it like, boom, it like lights her up in this beautiful way of like really warm sh sunlight and cool shadows. It's wonderful. So... <clears throat> I'm, I honestly don't even know like, if I would do this, but I might. So <laughs> I'm doing it now, right? <laughs> so, you can always change it. You can always change it. You can always, that's right. <laughs> What's that? And I've got my study over there, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So... Um, I'm just going to start to put like a uh, really um, pretty bright, it's not even bright enough. Sometimes you can't even tell until you put it down. And the thing is, like, here's the thing is, like, if you were to spend time in his studio or you're to spend time, like, watching me or whatever, when you put paint down on the canvas, it's not like you're never going to watch anybody paint in a matter of a few hours, right? And go like, oh, Eureka! <laughs> you know, like, I get it, you know? Because, like, the magic happens in here, right? And it's the subtlety in all of the handling of the paint. It's not, it's not like the, the one thing in the, in the one moment, you know, whatever. You know? So <clears throat> he would do something like this, right? So he might take, uh, you know, some <clears throat> bright paint if I want to create this sense of, like, shining light. And that's the thing. Like, when you, when you paint from, uh, from nature, right, it's like stuff happens. Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> 
like when I did the um, the painting of the the grist mill, which I'm sure a lot, a lot of you have seen on my website. And I tell, and I I often tell people this because I I just think it's the one of the best examples of uh, what I'm gonna say here. Um, but <clears throat> I'm standing out there. It's January. It's freezing cold. It's literally zero degrees. And Karen's brought me a muffin, which was really awesome. And I'm like standing out there, and uh, it was a fresh snowfall, a few inches. And all of a sudden, this huge gust of wind comes, right? And like, <laughs> take it, and, and, and you see, I'm looking down at the, at the, at the roof line, right, of the, of the mill, and all of this snow just comes, <laughs> like, blowing off the roof. And it's like, right in the, the, the sunlight is hitting it, and it's <laughs> blowing off the roof, right? And it only happened, like, once or twice the whole time that I'm out there, right? And I never would have seen it unless I'd been standing out there for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. To me, it's like one of the coolest things in the painting. What's the name mm. of your painting? Oh, the grist mill. Oh. It's it's just of the the grist mill in Sudbury at Longfellow's um, Inn, and uh, and it's like and and that's the thing. It's like when you when you uh, when you work from life, whether it, if if it's from a, from nature or from a model or or whatever, it's like stuff happens. It is one of the coolest things ever. You'll be thinking like, wow, this would be really cool if, you know, there was some, what, and then this, you know, the sunlight will shift a certain way or whatever. See? <laughs> and it will just like make the whole thing, right? But if you'd only taken a picture of it and then worked on your picture at home, you never would have even seen it to begin with. It never would have happened. Okay, so... Ta-da! So I'm, I'm going to, like, then I'm going to take this, so I'm going to take a rag and start to uh, oil it out a little bit. And what happens is, now, and... and so you got the medium over there. No, no, there's no medium. This is just like a straight rag, and the paint is, um, yeah, I mean, the rag tends to lift the paint a little bit, but it also tends to spread it, so... If you, you guys can look at this later, and you'll probably see in here what, what I did, and then aspects of this in other places, possibly, like where the paint is laid on thinner, right? But because of the transparency of the paint, right, it starts to cast this, like, little glow, right? Like there's a little mist, or there's, like, a little sunlight or whatever around it. And <clears throat> what happens is not just this, right, not just this uh, effect that will be incorporated into the lighting of this figure. But also, when you take this color of white and yellow and red that I've mixed together, right, and put on top of uh, these dark greens and uh, yellows and pinks or whatever, you get a combination of uh, pigment in such a way that it's like aspects of that color come out that can't happen any other way because the light is literally passing through layers of paint and coming back through those layers of paint again. And what happens with a, uh, a scumble like this is that a brighter color placed on top of a darker color will actually make the color on top, it'll bring out the cool colors within that. Like you can even do that if you have a, a shade of light brown and you put that brown on top of uh, a darker color but make it thinner, you'll see the cool qualities, the cooler colors of that brown come out. Right? It's just the way it works. And the same thing is true in the opposite, that if you put a, a darker color on top of a lighter color, the warmer aspects of that color come out. It's very, very cool. So even if you, you could work with a rainbow palette like I do, or you could work with a very limited palette of dead colors, but you could still make beautiful prismatic effects because of the combination of transparencies on top of one another, right? Do you glaze? In other words, are those really glazes? You mix them with flimsy, perhaps? Yeah, so I had enough uh, 
<clears throat> you could put some medium in your uh, paint before you, before you apply it, right? And that's gonna give you the ability to, it's gonna just make it more translucent, right? And so, I mean, a glaze is a very like technical word because you usually think of it as like a transparent pigment that you're putting on top of a, of a bright but um, colorless, relatively colorless foundation, right? But the way that I'm suggesting to use the paint is in a much more experimental way, which is just to try this, try that, you know, let it dry. You know, but, and see, this is a scary thing to do. That's one of the things about working this way is that it's like, this is the way that I feel. If, if I'm not proud of it yet, if I wouldn't hang it on the wall in my house or feel proud selling it, it's not done. So there's no any any risk of destroying it or ruining something that I created, right? Is just goes right out the window, right? Because if it's not there yet, then it's nothing. It's one. It's just an, it's just another one that's going to end up in a pile in the corner or or whatever or get painted over as a fresh canvas, right? So a lot of these things like scraping, sanding, scumbling, glazing, these are, you have, see, you have to destroy what you've done in some ways to build upon it, right? And that's why this is so nice because uh, now I can go back and paint again from life, right? And I'll keep, I'll basically rinse and repeat with everything, right? I'll scrape it, I'll sand it, I'll glaze it a little bit. I'll work on it again. And when I work on it from life, it's not, it, it literally, it's not gonna look any different than, than really than any of you painting on your paintings as well, right? It's just gonna be like, oh, he's just trying to, he's just, he's just painting the colors that he sees in her face. He's just painting the color of the grass as he sees it, you know? But then it's, it's this layering process, right? Of taking things down and having the freedom to glaze and modify, right? Because one of the things about this painting is that this, this color palette that I'm working with right now, as I did this, I discovered that it's too cool. My three colors of red, yellow, and blue are all too, a little, they're all too cool, and they can never be as warm as I need them to be. That's why I had to bring these other colors in, because I was like, it's just, it's too, the green's too cool, the blue's too cool, the red's, too, everything's too cool, right? So I needed to introduce some warmth. So before I actually go out and work on this again, I'm going to uh, scrape and sand probably the whole thing, and I'm going to glaze it with a warm color, right? Kind of an orangey yellow color. It, it'll look a little more like it does when you look through the viewing filter, right? And instantly, I'm going to create create even more subtlety in all of the color changes from, from area to area, but I'm also going to harmonize everything like very powerfully, right? Because it has that one mixture that's now woven into everything, right? So I have harmony. And the cool thing about, uh, one of the cool things about uh, glazing your paintings and glazing the whole thing with one color, if you choose to do that, <clears throat> is that you create a harmonious surface by, do, by bringing all those colors together, right? You harmonize them when you glaze the whole thing with one color. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then as you start to work on it again, because you're working on a surface that, is already has, that already has such a nice color harmony in it, it's much easier to maintain it and build on top of it. Right? Because every time you break that harmony, it's like, oh, damn, oh, you know, you can see it right away, right? So, uh, anyway, it works. So bright? Yeah. So, um, yeah, so uh, it's because, of, again, it has to do with the, the layering technique. So um, when you put uh, white paint down, on a relatively dark surface, it's not as bright as if you put it on a bright surface, right? So because I already have established a brighter surface on this area, you know, other than this area, whatever, it's because it's basically white on top of white on top of white. 
and it builds up in opacity so much that it reflects a tremendous amount more, more light. Yeah. Your uh, sunscreen that's being passed around? Yeah. Oh. Why not just use sunglasses? Why not just use sunglasses? <laughs> Well, I mean, you could. I, the other thing uh, that I wanted to mention, too, is that he doesn't just use that, uh, the black and white viewing filter. He also has like uh, a whole stack like that thick of different um, colors of uh, acetate paper, right? He's got like purple and yellow and green and orange and, you know, all these different things. So he'll sit there for like hours and just, you know, like flip through them, you know? Or would it look better with a little bit more green, a little bit more red? But then it also lets him to see the composition purely in terms of value and not in terms of like the colors, which can be so distracting. There's all these wonderful layers When do you know you're done? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love that question because I know the answer now. <laughs> I didn't know the answer until like a year ago, but uh, no. Well, for me, the, the answer is uh, when I can't see how to make it better. When I can't see how to make it better anymore. And that's really like that's really for everybody. It's kind of like it's it's like a mark in some ways. It's like. Everybody wants to paint in their own style, right? I really think that everybody wants to develop like their own unique like voice or style. I mean, it's, it would be so cool, right, to say, to have one of your paintings on the wall and, to ha and just have everybody say like, that's a so-and-so. Fill in the blank, fill in your name, right? That's, uh, that's so recognizably their work, right? And when you work on your paintings and you take them literally as far as you can go until you cannot see how to make it better, you will do that. That is how to do that. The way to make your mark, the way to make your style, to find your, your voice. Every time that paint touches a canvas, you make it the best that you can possibly do it every single time. You take it as far as you can until you cannot see how to make it better. And that's what I do. Even with paintings that fall apart and don't work and, and, and you know, whatever, because it happens every once in a while, right? It happens to everybody. But when, but, but when it happens, it, only, it, it, it doesn't happen for lack of trying, right? I'll, I'll beat the canvas to, to smithereens, <laughs> I'll, I'll, you know? It's like, I, 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 until I really feel like it, this is falling apart, this is not, if I feel several days in a row that it's not better than when I started, then I'll say, okay, it's time to move on to something else. But it's, but it's not, but, but I, but I, 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 I wouldn't let it go, you know? Don't you get sick of so. You're trying. <laughs> You're working so hard on the same thing. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, because... Because uh, I, I never start a painting, I, I try never to start a painting that I don't feel an incredible enthusiasm for right from the beginning. Right? And I'll tell you, like, the feeling of making something that you're proud of is like, to me, it's like, it's like one of the most fulfilling feelings that I know. It's like, because it's like, did it. You know, like, I actually made something I like, you know. <laughs> How long so, did you live over with Otto? Uh, I lived with him on and, like, mm, it, it, I mean, it was o only a f several months total, but over the course of several years, okay. on and off okay. in different um, places. Do you work more than Yeah, I, I do, but I try to, um, I try to have one focus at a time, yeah. Like this will this will sit in in uh, the studio for for the interim where I'm working on other things, and then I'll come back to it again. Um, but if I if my attention is is too divided for me, I you know I tend it tends to I don't know I, I lose something. It's like it's like that thing, right? He who tries to catch two rabbits catches none. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and try to stay focused. But, yeah.
So yeah, so thank you all so much for coming. I hope that uh, you, you all, uh, you know, like the list, you know? <laughs> and I'll stick around if you have any questions or whatever. And the palette. Yeah, and the palette, the foam core palette. It's what it's all about, you know?